here to talk to us about what South Africa is doing, but generally what the trends are is an important and I think very welcome. So thank you again uh, for being with us. And uh, without much further ado, I'm standing between you and your lunch and you and a very exciting lecture. So um, over to you, uh, Rob or Saeed. You. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I did uh, prepare. I, Can you I hold on a little bit? Oh, sorry. Uh, no. Can you hold on? Yes. We would like the Adidaji family to say a few words, uh, represented by the um, elder son of uh, Professor Adebayo Adedeji, uh, Doni Adedeji. Uh, perhaps to also say a few words about Adebayo Adedeji. For those of us who are not quite familiar with him, Adebayo Adedeji was the longest serving or is the longest serving executive secretary of ECA from 1975 to 1991. But that's not why we are celebrating him. We are celebrating him for his contributions towards the development of this continent. The role he played in regional integration uh, in terms of his contribution towards the formation of the regional economic communities, ECOWAS, ECAS, and also COMESA, is on waving commitment to the process of integration on this continent uh, dating from 1980, the Lagos Plan of Action, the Final Act of Lagos, the Abuja Treaty of 1991, and all the major landmark initiatives on this continent, Adebayo had his imprints on all of them, uh, which is the precursor to the CFTA that we are celebrating today. So um, on that note, I would like to call on Donya Dedeji. I hope it's online to give us a few words, five minutes uh, from the Adedeji family. Uh, Donya. I hope you're online. Yes, I am, Saeed. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Can you put, put on your camera, please? Can we see you? Yeah, my camera is on. My camera is on. Can you see me now? Go ahead. Please go ahead. Vera Songwe, Executive Secretary, ECA, Honorable Ministers of Finance, Economic Development and Planning, Excellencies, the guest lecturer, Dr. Rob Davis, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good day to you all. As you've been informed, my name is Joey Adedeji, and I'm the eldest child of Professor Adebayo Adedeji. On behalf of the Adebayo Adedeji family, I must say that we are proud and grateful that our father's memory and his contributions to the development of Africa continue to be honored and recognized by this, the annual Adebayo Adedeji Lecture Series. Thank you, Madam Executive Secretary, for this. The subject matter of this year's lecture, the African Continental Free Trade Area, aimed at creating a continental free trade zone with a market of 1.2 billion people and a combined GDP of 3 trillion US dollars, thereby laying the groundwork for a fully integrated African economy with free movement of people, goods, services, and all the concomitant benefits is one that I'm sure has my father sitting upright in his African print armchair up above, held tilted to one side, eyes twinkling and smiling broadly. An unrepentant believer in African integration and development, he used his pivotal position at UNECA to build a distinctive African voice on development issues of great significance to the continent by strengthening the research capability, policy advocacy, and human capacity of UNECA, and by serving as trusted advisor to African leaders on economic he was one of Africa's foremost proponents of regional integration. This reflected his deep conviction that it is through enhanced collaboration and integration that African countries shall overcome the challenges of small market sizes, landlocked countries, economies of skill and scope, and galvanize the continent's economic development into a vibrant and globally competitive African economy. As Nigeria's Federal Commissioner, Minister for Economic Development and Culture, he played a leading role in the establishment of the Economic 
Committee of West African States, ECOWAS. As Executive Secretary of UNECA, we actively promoted the creation of other regional groupings, including the Preferential Trade Agreement, PTA, which subsequently became the of Eastern and Southern Africa Commissar. It was also instrumental in the setting up of the Euro Economic Community of Central African States, ECAS. A passionate believer in African regional integration, a deeply committed builder of African regional institutions, and a fearless advocate for Africa's development, an African continent driven by the relentless drumbeat of self-sufficiency for its member states through economic and monetary union and the creation of a single large trading bloc was what he truly was most passionate about. That is why I'm sure, without a doubt, the shifting in capital, waiting in anticipation of Dr. Davis's lecture. Matter of fact, Dr. Davis, the sound in your ears right now is him whispering the point he particularly wants you to highlight in your lecture. Once again, good day, distinguished. Thank you and God. Mark. Mark, please, you can take over. Oh, thank you, Saeed. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Doin. Yes, indeed, the late Adebayo Adediji was once described as Africa's foremost prophet of regional integration. And those who knew him well uh, will tell you that the pipe-smoking professor was never one, one to mince his words when it comes to the topic of Africa's integration or Africa's self-determination. Now, the Adebayo Adediji is in recognition of the remarkable achievements and contributions of the professor to the work of the EA and the work of the African development process. Uh, this year, the annual Adebayo Adediji lecture will explore what policymakers need to do next as the game-changing African continental free trade area. So, the 2021 Adediji lecture will be delivered by Davis on the theme towards the development approach to the AFCFTA. Dr. Davis is a familiar face to many here after serving two five-year terms as South Africa's Minister of Trade and Industry. He's a prolific writer too and is a contributor to the advancement of the thinking around Africa's growth and in particular the AFCFTA. Without much ado, I yield the floor uh, to the 2021 Adibayo Adideji lecturer, Robert Davis, former Minister of Trade and Industry in South Africa, sir. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mark, and uh, good afternoon uh, to all the uh, distinguished uh, delegates who are in the audience. Um, I did write a longer paper, uh, which I'm not going to read out. I'm going to try to summarize it, and I do hope that those who are interested will be able to access the longer paper uh, through uh, UNECA. But I'd like to begin by thanking the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, uh, and its Executive Secretary, Dr. Vera Shongwe, uh, both for inviting me originally to give this lecture this time last year. As we know, uh, COVID-19 first wave made it impossible to hold uh, this lecture last year. So I'm grateful for the original invitation and then also for rolling over the invitation to allow me uh, to uh, give this lecture this year. I'm greatly honored to be invited to deliver a lecture dedicated to the memory of a great African uh, scholar and public servant, uh, Professor Adebayo Adedeji. I had the privilege of getting to know Professor Adedeji in the early 1990s when he invited me, uh, then a research professor at the University of the Western Cape, to serve on the advisory committee of his research institute, the African Center for Development and Strategic Studies, known by its acronym ACTES. I fondly recall traveling uh, to ACTES meetings in Ijebu Odi, uh, Professor Adedeji's hometown in Ogun State in Nigeria, where it was evident even to the occasional visitor that he was greatly respected in the community. Professor Adedeji was also a major figure in discussions on the future of African regional integration in the years immediately before South Africa's democratic transition. 
And I'm proud to have authored a chapter in a volume edited by him entitled South Africa and Africa Within or Apart. But I think we all know that Professor Adedeji is best known as a former executive secretary of this organization, UNICO. And in this capacity, he's renowned for the development of the African Alternative Framework to Structural Adjustment Programs for Socioeconomic, develop, uh, socioeconomic Recovery and Transformation, known by its acronym AFSAP. AFSAP became a major beacon, looked to by many, then doubted that externally, externally imposed structural adjustment programs were the best or the only way forward in the continent. In preparing this lecture, I reread a number of the key messages of AFSAP, and I was struck at how many of these remain relevant more than 30 years on. AFSAP's point of departure and major premise was, and I quote from its very first sentence, the structure of the African economy defines the essential features of Africa's central problem of underdevelopment, end quote. AFSAP then identified what it saw as the structural weakness of most African economies. They included a weak productive base characterized by low productivity and productive activities dominated either by subsistence or by export orientated primary product production. And from this, AFSAP identified the central task as the structural transformation of African economies. One key element of this, and I quote from paragraph 43, quote, Africa has to break the apron strings of structural and relational dependence on producing a limited number of cheap primary commodities for export, end quote. This highly pertinent observation remains, in my opinion, as valid today as it was in 1990. It speaks to a reality highlighted by the experience of those very few countries that have transitioned from being low to high income or from underdeveloped to developed economies. The vast majority of these have achieved this transition by passing through a stage of economic diversification involving a shift to higher value added production, in a word they industrialized. Poor countries stayed poor because they remained trapped in their colonially defined role as producers and exporters of some or other primary product or products, be it agricultural or mineral. Products that are used for industrial production elsewhere. Developments that have unfolded in the period since the 1990s, including the rise of globally networked industries or global value chains, and the emergence of more complex and knowledge intensive products have increased the imperative to break from what AFSAP called the apron strings of dependence on primary commodity production and export. I give some figures that, that in 2014, uh, Africa produced and exported coffee to the value of six billion US dollars. But that raw material was used without too much further physical transformation in products which were sold abroad uh, for a total of about 100 billion US dollars, meaning that 94% of that value chain was captured in activities other than the production of the raw material. I point out that in the example of the iPhone 6, which is by now an out-of-date uh, iPhone, uh, that was retailing for about $649 in the United States, the cost of the mineral products in that uh, cell phone uh, totaled about one, uh, just over $1, or 0.16% of the total uh, price for that product. So those few underdeveloped countries that, uh, uh, that have more recently emerged as high income or moderately prosperous countries have all followed the same path as early industrializers. Whether they were the East Asian newly industrializing economies in the 1960s and 70s, or more recently China, the governments pursued active industrial policies that promoted, nurtured, and indeed protected nascent industries. The industrialization they experienced not only resulted in greater output and higher incomes for those directly involved in manufacturing, it also supported a host of related service activities that created higher quality, better remunerated, and higher quality jobs than existed before. And I then point out by uh, drawing on uh, some of the literature, including from uh, a, a Norwegian economist and economic historian, Eric Reinhardt, who points out how this 
leads to a general rise in incomes across the economies, uh, even uh, for those involved in jobs uh, which are comparable uh, to jobs carried uh, to jobs carried out uh, in uh, poorer countries. So, for example, he says that the reason that uh, um, uh, bus drivers, hotel personnel, luggage handlers, barbers, and shop attendants in Peru are paid less than uh, their counterparts in Norway is not because they are less productive or work less hard, but because the level of, of, of uh, incomes in Norway, an industrialized country, are much higher on average than those in Peru. Our leaders then are perfectly correct when they've, re when they've repeatedly called for the industrialization of the continent. Responding to the challenge to develop our countries and create better living standards for our people, peoples requires that we move up the value chain by breaking, as AFSAF put it, the structural apron strings that have kept much of our continent in its colonially defined place in the global division of labor. But we need to recognize that our efforts are taking place in the context of pre-existing global negative challenges, as well as the impact of the COVID-19 socioeconomic as well as health crisis. The first mega challenge that I talk about is the imperative to mitigate and adapt to human-induced climate change. And the second is the transformational uh, technological uh, changes associated with, this, with what's called a fourth industrial revolution. I point out that the UN special report, uh, the panel on climate change, indicated that we are not on track at the moment to achieve less than two degrees uh, rise in, in, in global temperatures by the end of the century. And that if we're going to achieve this, we have to have net zero emissions by 2050. And this in my uh, estimation points to the likelihood and indeed, indeed necessity of a structural transformation that will take place uh, involving a transition to a lower carbon, carbon economy that will affect all forms of productive activity. And this is in the basket, uh, if you like, of mitigation. It also means that we will have some rise in, in, in global temperatures, even if we all act together to reduce it to less than catastrophic levels. And that will have extreme, mean extreme weather events, which will require that we have a massive infrastructure investment. If we don't do it proactively, we'll have to do it reactively uh, uh, to avoid uh, the implications uh, of uh, unavoidable climate change that's already underway. And both of these imperatives are seeing the development of new green technologies and indeed a wave of green industrialization. At the same time, we're in the early stages of what's called the fourth industrial revolution. As I understand it, the years that followed the onset of the global economic crisis of 2007-8 saw digital technology which had developed in an earlier period advancing in new directions and in ways that are set to bring about not just quantitative but also qualitative change. Digital technologies began to advance into the realm of big data management, mining and application. And in 2016, Professor Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum argued that the world was on the cusp of, quote, a technology revolution unlike anything humankind has experienced before set to bring about disruptive change in practically all sectors of all economies. I think you had a discussion earlier on, so I'm not gonna go through all of the new technologies, but I do want to just say that while many of them have the uh, potential to raise human welfare by increasing productivity, while they have uh, been seen with examples on this continent to be able to offer innovative solutions to a host of developmental challenges through things like cell phone banking, the use of drones to deliver medicines, uh, the development of, uh, of apps that draw small producers and service providers uh, into networks and markets and giving them uh, more, more market access. Um, and while it is therefore entirely appropriate to examine the, 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 uh, the tech opportunities these technologies uh, uh, um, offer, we need also to be aware that the, that the rollout of the very same technologies are also posing enormous challenges. So I cite uh, the, the uh, uh, writings of uh, two MIT economists, Eric Brynjofelsen and Andrew McAfee, uh, who explain how uh, these technologies operating on a global scale tend to produce winner takes most markets where we have huge concentrations of benefits for the innovators and very little 
uh, for the author runs or runners up. For manufacturing, the potential disruptive changes associated with it are not just what's going to happen in individual domestic economies, but are also look likely to impact on the location of industries around the world. I point out that additive manufacturing network through the Internet of Things looks likely to replace large assembly lines with smaller scale processes located closer to the sites of consumption. And that also uh, they will reduce the advantage of lower wages uh, in manufacturing processes. And this was exemplified in 2017 when Adidas announced it was relocating some of its production processes from Bangladesh to Germany on the grounds that a combination of 3D printing and robotics had lowered production costs below those that could be obtained by paying lower wages in Asia. The, the disruptive changes will affect all other sectors, mining and agriculture, financial services, legal services, the practice of medicine, education, and a host of other services. Uh, at the same time, I, I, um, Parminder Jeet Singh, who's a, an Indian scholar who's looked at this, describes that the global value chains and the top of the global value chains are going to be changing dramatically. And he says, and I quote, as industrialization placed machine power at the center of the economy, digitalization makes digital intelligence its new fulcrum. The factory as the site of mechanized production was the central economic institution of the industrial age. For the digital age, it is sectoral platforms that reorganize entire economic activities in any sector based on in digital intelligence from data. I then point out using untapped figures and others that uh, there's a high level of concentration uh, of uh, those uh, companies that are at the head of, uh, of, of digital uh, uh, value chains. And I'm saying that both green industrialization and the fourth industrial revolution will both enhance the imperative and raise the bar for Africa's drive to industrialize. If the continent is left behind as these developments unfold, the negatives of exclusion will outweigh the benefits of the introduction uh, of products or systems based on new technologies. And indeed, the ability of the, of the continent's ability uh, to construct a scenario in which the positives outweigh the negatives will, be the, it will, will depend on the extent uh, to which it's able to, to industrialize. So I'm suggesting that, uh, that, 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 that these mega challenges will raise the bar. But on top of this, we also face the challenge of recovering from the pandemic induced what many people are calling the great lockdown recession. According to World Bank estimates, the GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa shrunk by an average of 3.7% last year. And even if optimistic projections of 2% growth of a smaller base do materialize in 2021, this will be less than the population growth rate, meaning that average living standards will again fall, raising the specter that some have spoken about of a prolonged period in which living standards will be below those uh, which we uh, had in pre-pandemic uh, uh, periods. Um, I then go on to point out that uh, while we may be seeing some recovery of commodity prices, this is taking place in a context of rising debt for an increasing number of countries. And then on top of all of that, the Director General of the World Health Organization has spoken of a, quote, catastrophic moral failure in the role of rollout of vaccines, meaning that people in the rich world will be vaccinated earlier than more vulnerable people in the developed poorer countries. And all of this highlights, in my view, the perils of continuing to just be consumers and not producers of medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, and in particular vaccines. All of this points to the urgent necessity of basing a recovery strategy from the COVID-19 socioeconomic crisis, not on going back to where we were, but on striving with renewed commit, commitment and urgency to bring about structural transformation of the, of the African economy along the lines called for by Professor Adedeji. What does all this mean for the key flagship project rightly absorbing much of the attention of the continent right now, the operationalization of the African continental free trade area. We can all be proud of the fact that despite the pandemic, the continental free trade area entered into force as a commercially meaningful partial free trade area at the beginning of this year. The Secretariat is now established 
and already hard at work on, assure, on uh, ensuring its implementation. I included a short chapter on the Continental FTA in a small volume which I published at the end of 2019 uh, by the, in, uh, under the South Centers aegis and which is available uh, for downloading, downloading from their website free of charge. In it, I argued that the lead up to the, the, in, the in the lead up to the, the establishment of the Continental FTA, we faced a strategic choice whether the next stage of African integration should prioritize the broadening of integration by establishing a free trade area be, reaching beyond the existing regional communities or of deepening integration within existing RECs by moving them to customs union, common markets or monetary unions. And my argument is that ever the pathway or pathways that eventually led us to prioritize the broadening of integration by establishing a continental free trade area, that decision in my view was both correct and appropriate to the circumstances we find ourselves in. I point out, and I'm not going to read this, I point out that we have seen a declining a willingness of the developed world to accept manufactured goods coming from other countries. Uh, this has been evident most dramatically during the Trump administration, but I suggest that although we might see some return to uh, a level of uh, multilateralism under the Biden administration, which will of course be welcome, I doubt that we're going to see anything like uh, a willingness to accept uh, um, uh, a, a non-reciprocal uh, entry uh, of products either in the United States or in other parts of the developed world. And the reason for this is that the country which benefited from the globalization of the 1990s was China. Uh, and China is now a significant competitor uh, to uh, the developed world. I argue that China's rise did not follow the prescriptions of neoliberalism, but rather its development strategy and path can be much more recognized as being in line uh, with that of other uh, industrializers uh, that it adopted uh, and uh, implemented uh, industrial policy. And that this has led to China becoming a, a serious competitor, uh, particularly in the products and technologies uh, of the uh, digital age. And that this is a factor which I think is affecting international relations and will continue to do so uh, for some time to come. What this means immediately is that even if we in Africa wanted to base an industrialization effort on production of value added products for exports to the markets of the developed world, that path is much less available to us than it, than it was to previous industrializers and even to China at an earlier stage of its industrialization. Under such circumstances, several of the more successful developing countries, China and India among them, have been turning the, to domestic consumption to drive the next phase of their development. The problem facing African countries in moving in a similar direction is that none of us, not even the largest, has a domestic market of sufficient scale to drive significant industrialization. However, if we look at the statistics for the, common, the continent as a whole, it's 1.2 billion people and a combined GDP of 2.3 trillion does offer a base for significant diversification and potentially deep industrialization. So we all know and we've all said that uh, F, the continental free trade area uh, will be supporting an increase in intra-regional trade. And of course, that would be an important gain and an indication of the success of the continental FTA. But I would suggest that the real prize of the continental free trade area would be if it supported the emergence of regional value chains involved in the production of higher value added goods and services. Such an outcome could expect to see components and other intermediate inputs being produced in a number of African countries before being assembled into products of Africa consumed by the citizens of this continent and then also exported. Under such a scenario, we could expect to see not just a quantitative increase in inter-regional trade, but a qualitative change in its character. This would involve a greater absolute and relative intra-trade in components and intermediate products, which are in fact the largest and fastest growing part of, of global trading goods. For this to occur, it's important to recognize that trade integration is not a standalone. It must be an integral component of a broader economic integration process. 
And again, we can turn to AFSA for guidance in this regard. Paragraph 47 argues that Africa's integration must, quote, involve three mutually interdependent dimensions. The integration of the physical, social, and institutional infrastructure, B, the integration of production structures, and C, the integration of African markets, end quote. This speaks to the elements long argued by the proponents of development integration. A fundamental point of departure of the development integration perspective is that developing country re in developing country regions, low levels of intra-regional trade are not only or even principally the result of high customs tariffs uh, or other regulatory barriers. Underdeveloped production structures and inadequate infrastructure are also critical factors. Thus, if country X is a producer and exporter of some raw material exported abroad, it has little to trade with country Y next door, which produces and exports some other primary product. If the roads and rail networks built are built fundamentally to take a raw material from the mine or the farm to the nearest port for export out of the region and are inadequate in, living up, in linking our country X and Y, that too will impede trade between them. And from this, it is argued by proponents of development integration that trade liberalization alone, the reduction of tariffs and perhaps the smoothing of other regulatory barriers will only go so far. Two other pillars need to be integral to the integration effort. The first is into infrastructure development, uh, and the second is cooperation uh, in uh, the uh, uh, emergence of productive capacity and greater diversification and higher value added uh, activity. If the Continental Free Trade Agreement were to become reduced to a conventional trade integration arrangement, it would very likely entrench the competitive advantage and polarization in favor of the very few countries currently having some capacity to export finished goods to the rest of the continent. South Africa, Egypt, Morocco, Kenya, and maybe some others. This could very likely provoke others to push for weak rules of origin that could lead to a proliferation of low value added screwdriver type industries emerging in other countries. On a worst case scenario, this could result in a net lowering of the overall level of value addition on the continent. And if this were to occur, it would mean that the main beneficiaries of the continental FTA would be those external parties producing goods subject to only nominal value addition on the continent. It would be worse if we were to su succumb to the siren songs of many external forces urging that African continental free trade area becomes a stepping stone towards greater liberalization uh, towards them. There are many external forces giving nominal support to, after, uh, to, to the continental FTA because they hope it will be a step towards opening up third party access to a larger African market and thereby, thereby enhancing the value of the FTA uh, they seek beyond that available with individual countries. The kind of supposedly 21st century high quality agreements envisaged by many would only be slightly asymmetrical or differentiated and include numerous behind the border trade related chapters that would without doubt severely curtail policy space essentially for a drive to industrialize. The continental FTA must at the stage we find ourselves in entrench a real advantage for continental producers over others. If it does not, it will be extra regional rather than African producers that are the main beneficiaries of trade liberalization in the African continental free trade area. If the continental free trade area is to fulfill its promise as a tool for inclusive development, industrialization and diversification, it needs to embrace more of the perspectives of a development integration program. This is not to suggest that the continent pauses to engage in a theoretical debate about paradigms. Even if this were desirable, which it is not, it could result merely in the formal adoption of wording in documents. What is needed as the continental FTA moves into operationalization, in my view, is that practical implementation processes become firmly rooted in addressing concrete developmental challenges and providing more opportunities for the continent to move towards higher value added production. The insignificant progress recorded in industrial cooperation, whether at REC or AU level, should be a matter of concern. 
Industrial co cooperation needs to rise above the kind of consultancy heavy scoping exercise that had dominated the work in formal bodies up to now. And it must move towards delivering forward thinking proposals for sectorally specific win-win outcomes taking into account the continental FTA. I'm just suggesting that ongoing work involving private sector players and some governments to try to produce an African auto pact is perhaps a pointer in this regard. I do know also that there are other uh, efforts in other uh, industries and sectors. In the circumstances we find ourselves in, it is imperative that the continental FTA becomes a, a, a tool of structural transformation and industrialization. It is encouraging that research bodies, industry associations, and trade unions across the continent are beginning to grapple with this issue. The Secretary General of the Continental FTA, Juan Kelly Mene, is also deeply committed to working to ensure that the Continental FTA fulfills its, pro its potential in this regard and is in the process of establishing a consultative body to advise how the a Continental FTA can underpin the continent's industrialization. These are positive developments that can and must be built on. Let me conclude with my final reference to the man in whose honor this lecture has been held. In the concluding chapter of the volume he edited, South Africa and Africa Within or Apart, Professor Adejeji wrote with reference to the Lagos Plan of Action, and I quote, while governments all over Africa swear by the plan and play homage to it from time to time, this has been no more than lip service as it has been honored more by neglect than by implementation, end quote. He went on to lament that AFSAP was suffering the same fate and argued that, quote, leadership is most crucial. It has to be visionary and practical at the same time. It should be pragmatic and eclectic, eclectic without in any way compromising the relentless pursuit of the overall goal. And above all, there's a need for minimum qualifications with regard to legitimacy, honesty, accountability, integrity, competence, commitment, and responsibility, end quote. Those qualities are critical as we implement a transformative and developmental African continental free trade area. Let us then renew our commitment to them as we honor the memory of a great African scholar and activist. I thank you uh, for this opportunity and for your attention. Thank you very much, Rob Davis, former Minister of Trade and Industry, South Africa, for um, a very, very rich uh, lecture that offered us uh, many, many uh, questions. As is the nature of these lectures, we'll now hear from the elected respondent uh, if we have any time. Uh, here we turn to a lady who I believe only last week took up her post in a cabinet reshuffle in her country. We're very uh, pleased to welcome Biata Habita Rimana, who is the Minister of Trade and Industry for Rwanda. Madam, you are the respondent. You have the floor. Thank you. Yes. Your Excellency uh, Abi Ahmed, Prime Minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, Your Excellency Dr. Grant Songwe, Executive Secretary, United Nations Economic Commission from Africa, Baroness Minush Shafiq, Director of the London School of Economics, Dr. Rob Davis, 2021 Adedeji Lecturer, Honorable Ministers, All Protocol Observes, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Allow me to begin by expressing my sincere thanks and gratitude to Dr. Vera Songwe and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa for the honor to participate and respond to this year's Adebayo Adedeji Lecture. It is an honor to reflect on Africa's development path through this memorial lecture in remembrance of one of Africa's greatest scholars and thinkers. My name is Beata Habjarimana, the recently appointed Minister of Trade and Industry of the Republic of Rwanda. When my predecessor, Madame Soraya Hakuziaremye, informed me of the invitation to this conference and the opportunity to react to this lecture, I felt it important to participate and share my thoughts 
and views on is this your theme on sustainable industrialization and diversification of Africa in the digital era in the context of COVID-19. The lecture which Dr. Davis has just delivered on this topic has been insightful and inspiring. He has eloquently and presciently reflected on the opportunities and the challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on our economies and the road to recover ahead. Indeed, as we look to build back better and stronger in the wake of this pandemic, we must do so with sustainable industrialization and diversification in the digital era context at the forefront of our policy decision. Your Excellences, Honorable Ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to share a few reflections on Dr. Davis' lecture, which stand out and must form the discussion of the continent moving forward. The first addresses the mega global challenges in a post COVID-19 era beyond the health crisis. These being the rising imperative to mitigate and adapt to human induced climate change and the technological transformations associated with the fourth industrial revolution. Dr. Davis rightly notes that both these challenges we enhance the imperative and raise the bar for Africa's drive to industrialization, ensure that we are not left behind as this development unfold. Africa, therefore, must prepare itself and preserve the policy space and policy tools to support, nurture, and protect emerging manufacturing industries. The urgency and focus of our recovery strategies should be focused on bringing about a structural transformation of the African economy, breaking what he and the esteemed Prof. Adebayo termed the upon strings of dependence on the production of primary commodities by diversifying and moving to higher value added production. Furthermore, Dr. Davis emphasized the importance of the changing global landscape conflated by the pandemic, climate change, and the fourth industrial revolution, and urges for the need to speak with a united African voice to retain the tools which have enabled advanced economy and uh, emerging giant like China, South Korea, and Taiwan to industrialize and attain high income. For Africa, African continental free trade area represent one such a tool for the continent's structural transformation, sustainable industrialization, and adoption of future industries. It must be utilized to entrench advantages for continental producers over others and resolve concrete development challenges and opportunities for the continent to move toward higher value added production. Your Excellences, Honorable Ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the development path laid out by this lecture touches on critical element of importance to the African continent, but also specifically to Rwanda's development agenda, the national transformation the National Strategy for Transformation. Structural transformation through industrialization is paramount in our seven-year development goal. It envisages creating over 200,000 decent and productive jobs annually by leveraging on the manufacturing and services sector. Indeed, industrial policy tools our government has put in place have sought to learn and adapt to best practices, borrowing from the choices and experiences of advanced and emerging economies. Today, Rwanda has developed special economic zones, consolidated investment promotion and facilitation 
under one roof and established attractive investment incentives to encourage value added manufacturing in our domestic industrial sectors, which have consequently resulted in the industrial sector contribution to GDP increasing from 14% to 19% between 2015 and 2019. In addition, we have implemented robust policy decisions and strategic interventions to recapture domestic market and industry, promoting local made in Rwanda products and services. While this is still well below our expectation under the national strategy transformation and the broader vision 2050 trajectory, manufacturing value added industrialization must be Rwanda's and Africa's priority goal. In the context of industrialization and diversification, efforts to improve industry competitiveness, quality, and scale production should exceed our traditional and extractive primary commodities, which have relegated Africa to the periphery of the global economic system. The promise and goal must be to add value, to integrate services to manufacturing, to increase trade and investment across the continent, and to contribute fundamentally to global manufacturing output. The hope of the African continental free trade area is that with a broader market size of 1.3 billion people, with reduced tariffs, and trade facilitation mechanism, regional value chain can develop and progressively enhance competitiveness, increase income, and higher value added exports. Only through effectively implementing this agreement can we catch up with advanced economies and ensure not left behind further still. As Dr. Davis points out, however, Infrastructure development is also an important factor to regional trade, and so investments in road, rail, and air links is without question. We must strive to develop and fund joint infrastructure projects, ease cross-border movement and restriction, establish Pan-African telecommunication networks and financial tools to accelerate regional and continental cooperation. Of course, the political economy in which Africa is developing and industrializing is vastly different from any other periods in time. And Dr. Davis has illustrated this point. Besides the impact that COVID-19 has had on our fiscal space and increasing debt levels necessary to drive industrial development, the consequences of climate change on future industrialization make it that much more difficult for the continent to industrialize. Nevertheless, our collective future are at stake and we must work to preserve and protect our environment sustainably. Here in Rwanda, we have seen that sustainable industrialization can be achieved if collectively pursued. For over a decade, we have banned plastic bags in the country. But industries, wholesale and retail trade have found environmentally friendly alternatives. Over 50% of our electricity generation today comes from renewable sources like geothermal, solar and hydroelectric, sustainably feeding into the electrification and industrialization of Rwanda's future. The resources are there for African to produce efficiently and safely and preserve our place for generations to come. Likewise, labor intensive industries which underpin previous industrialization in North America, Europe, and Asia, and are often transposed to cheap labor economies are threatened by additive manufacturing, 
robotics, and higher value embedded services abroad. How then can Africa ensure that its industrialization also uplifts millions from poverty and has the same structurally transformative impact that previous revolutions enabled? Africa has never been short of resilience, of capability or drive. We must adapt and develop policy tools to ensure that as we industrialize, we invest and position our industries to integrate into industrial sectors of the future and develop local capacity to provide essential pre and post industrialization embedded services Minister. Shoring and domestic localization of manufacturing is only going to accelerate in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, Africa must provide a value proposition for localization in Africa to serve global and regional value chain. The African continental free trade area provides what's shut and view for Africa. Minister. As I conclude, I'm reminding Dr. Davis of the crucial importance of cooperation to achieving industrial development. Africa is coming together, forming irreversible bonds through mechanisms like the African continent of free trade area and conferences like the one today. Our future development as a continent must be attained together. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you, Minister of Trade and Industry for Rwanda. Now I will go for the vote of thanks and closing back to Saeed. Ade Jumobi, the Director of the Strategic Planning Oversight and Results Division, or SCORD, at ECA. Saeed, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mark. Um, on behalf of the Executive Secretary of ECA, uh, Ms. Vera Sungwe, I would like to thank all the participants um, of this uh, lecture, and in particular to thank our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Rob Davis, and also the discussant, um, Her Excellency, uh, Ms. Beta Abraimana, the Minister for Trade and Industry uh, of Rwanda. Adebayo Adedeji represents a set of ideas. These are the ideas of regional integration, self-reliant development, structural transformation, and an unrepentant commitment to the African dream and the African project. And I think in an important sense, it connects also with the uh, guest speaker uh, of, this, uh, of this event, which is Dr. Rob Davis. I think uh, Comrade Rob Davis and also Adebayo Adedeji share a few things in common, which I'll touch upon very quickly. Uh, one is about the fact that both of them held high political positions, and they also knew when to step down uh, from those positions. Adebayo Adedeji was Minister for Economic Development in Nigeria, uh, Comrade of Davis was also Minister of Trade and Industry. Both of them are seasoned technocrats. Both of them are also uh, uh, scholars. And both of them are very committed uh, to the African project in terms of the economic and social transformation of this continent. And finally, both of them believe that Africa's rescue plan cannot come from anywhere else except this continent. I thank you and thanks for coming and participating in this event. Mark, you can thank formally you. close the event. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I do, uh, we will be returning to the main session shortly. And please join us because we have the big debate where the subject is the multilateral system. Was it prepared for COVID-19 crisis and did the private sector do enough? Standing by is Nigeria's finance minister uh, to join us as, as are many other ministers and high level speakers. I want to thank uh, Rob Davis uh, and also the Minister of Trade for Rwanda for a very stimulating half hour there. This concludes the 2021 Adebayo Adedeji lecture. Uh, good day. Uh, have a nice lunch and I'll see you on the other side.
next debate. Thank you very much.